Well, this is Tell Me Your Story. Yes, I am Richard Dugan, and I'm always looking for a new way to open these programs, something different, something unique. Well, uh, I guess the best way to put this, we have a returning guest. Uh, he's he's not just a guest, ladies and gentlemen. He's not just a friend. I can honestly say this. Um, he's a brother. He really is, although he's not a bald brother. Uh, I've tried to get him to shave his head. He just won't do it. But that's okay. I will still uh, allow him into my home and my heart. Uh, as we, I'll put it. I'll put it this way: we bust up some more tiles to continue the creation of guess what, the mosaic, and that is the his book that uh, I just finished reading on Audible. And uh, Daniel Levin, welcome back. It is wonderful to have you. You're all the way down there. You're on the uh, uh, West Coast literally yes. three blocks from it. And uh, thank you for being with us. It's absolutely an honor. We have, since we have spoken before, we actually moved inland. So we are unfortunately not three blocks in, we're not in Encinitas anymore, th three blocks from the ocean. We're actually inland. So I'm now looking out my window to the foothills of the mountains of whatever they are, San Bernardino Mountains, I think. I don't even know what they are. <laughs> well, well, you're still close to the ocean, as am yeah. I. My home is uh, seven, 14 miles. i got to come downhill. Uh, as the crow flies, it's probably maybe eight or 10. But because you have to travel this particular mountain road and it's meandering, um, but at least I can get there in just maybe 15, 20 minutes. I can walk there in 15, 20 minutes from the radio station that I work for. And one of the things that I've been doing of late, and when I say of late, it's been the last few years, and it seems like it's been a few years since you and I have talked on the program here. I have been not only listening to your book from cover to cover on Audible, folks, it is available on Audible, but um, pondering. Sometimes even my my role, if you will, my part in the universe, you know, my little little bit that I'm doing as as you are doing and trying to gather up uh, these these pieces, as I refer to the pieces of the puzzle, although I'll use the term mosaic uh, so as to be able to one day see the big picture, you know, and I think one day we will. Uh, I've I've lost a couple of uh, family members. Last year, it was my eldest sister. This year, it was my father. And Sorry. after 53 years of friendship, meeting in sixth grade, I lost my best friend. And uh, uh, I lost him this year. And it's funny because every time I think about him and it's like, oh, it's so sad. And it's like, and I start thinking about all of the stuff that we used to do. I can't cry. It just, it just won't happen. At least not yet anyway. It may someday, but it's like, I am so grateful that he was in my life and I was in his because we were support for one another. And that's part of what this program is about and part of what your your book, The Mosaic, is about. But that's not all that you've written. You uh, you pop stuff onto Facebook, which I have read, uh, different, different things of this nature. Um, I am curious about one thing as we get started here, Jeez. what was the impetus for growing the beard? Because as long as I have known you up until five or six years ago, you were clean shaven or you had a soul patch or maybe a mustache. Yes. But I think I, think I had a, uh, a little patch there. Yeah. Um, I've had, I've had a beard over the years and I had, a, I had, I just actually cut it back because it's a, it's a little bit more burly than it, than it is right now. Um, but I was looking a little too much like either Santa Claus or a holy man. Um, and, and I'm neither, I'm neither one nor the other. And so I thought, well, what would happen if I trimmed it back? And I think it's just, um, I get bored easily. So I like to have some, whatever I can change. I wish I could change my waistline as quickly as I could change my facial hair. <laughs> I don't seem to be good, have the good fortune to do that. Um, 
and I still keep at it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny too, because, um, I, I injured my right elbow, uh, several years ago and I couldn't bend my arm to shave my head Oh wow! or my face. And so I thought, well, I'll just let it go until it heals. And I thought it would just be a couple of weeks, but it was like a month and a half. Wow. And <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, I kind of like the way it's starting to look, you know, it's still scraggly. It's still thin, but let's see. And it came in and I let it go and let it go. Started almost to the level of where you are now. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I'm going to keep it. I'm going to shave my head because I didn't like the way that was looking. I, I inherited from my father that bald spot right in the back where that soft spot is when you're a baby. Yes. Um, but I shaved my head in 20, 2001 because my wife had cancer. She was going to have chemo, was going to lose her hair. And in solidarity and love for her, I was going to shave my head. And I had long hair at that time. I had a ponytail. Yeah. And we went to the salon and she said, I can't do it. I says, what do you mean? She says, I found out that they're not going to be using such a strong chemo and my hair is not going to fall out. It's just going to thin. Oh, so wow. I'm not going to do it. And I said, okay, but I'm primed and ready to go. So wow. uh, I did that for her. And I can, and I have to say that I continue to do that. And when I see videos on YouTube and so forth, where I see, uh, I remember watching one where this uh, uh, young gal was in a, in a salon and she was getting her hair shaved off right after she was finished. And of course she's facing that mirror, you know, how you face the mirror uh, in a barbershop or a salon. And all of a sudden he took it and he just started cutting his hair and she just broke down. Oh, it was a beautiful moment. And, and that's kind of like the giving that people uh, use, they, the, the kindness that people show to one another saying, look, I may not know what you're going through, but I'm going to share a little part of it. And the mosaic or case, is, or in this case, sheer, sheer, yeah, exactly, very good. <laughs> but the mosaic is along the same lines of the various characters, the various elements. Uh, you know, the priest, and uh, I keep thinking of the one, the juice man, uh, and the garbage man, and all of the different characters within the mosaic that help uh, Mo to try to piece together his understanding yeah. uh yes of, and i have to say when i was reading i think it's the first chapter where it's revealed that he lo he loses his father yes and i had i i just i'm i'm thinking boy this is serendipitous you know i just lost my father you know and um uh i um I just I, I could certainly relate to Mo and his wanting to understand to some degree. But there's a part of me that has always understood, even yeah. from a very early age, probably my teens. Yeah. That mom and dad are not going to be on this planet forever. One day I'm going to get that call, you know, and those kinds of things. Yeah, I grew up in a very uh, different time. My my dad's been gone already 55 years. Wow. And my mom passed away two years later on the exact same day at exactly the same time. So 53 years. And that day was July 4th. So I started to think, what does Independence Day mean? Um, and I started to build up these whole stories around I have to be independent and I have to be able to do things on my own. And I have to like, you know, they were giving me a, they were ushering in a new way for me to be, which was not dependent, but independent. And I believed that for a long time until I sat and I said, hold it. They died on Independence Day. They weren't born on Independence Day. If they were born on Independence Day, I could see crafting a story about how they wanted me to have independence. But dying on Independence Day, what they were really trying to tell me that I had mistakenly misunderstood all that time is independence means death, that we don't get anywhere only on our own. And we are all an interconnected reality. And the more we, we the more we allow ourselves the openness to connect to people at whatever level we can, like I always say, the pieces of mosaic very rarely come together one side to another full flush. Sometimes they just come corner to corner, barely touching each other. But that corner to corner touch is enough to complete a whole artistry 
that has magnificence in it. And we do the same thing. I think I, I don't know what we do. I can tell you what I do because I, I can't speak for anybody else. But I find in the relationships I have with others, sometimes it's very tangential. Sometimes it's very deep. Sometimes it stays forever. Sometimes it's gone the next day. But being able to make those connections without fear of what will happen when it's not here. Um, and as we get further into the show, maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about something I'm going through right now, but I don't want to just ramble on. Oh, no problem. We're talking with Daniel Levin. His book is The Mosaic. Uh, he has a website. We'll give that to you shortly. And uh, you are listening to Tell Me Your Story. I wanted to dive into a subject here regarding our fathers and their departure. And when you when you talk about Independence Day, that's that's kind of what I was thinking about uh, as as you would describe that in the book. And I'm thinking now they're independent. Now they're free. And and the beautiful thing of it was before my sister and my father, they were both located sister in Scottsdale, father in Phoenix uh, and so forth. <clears throat> I think he's probably Oh, uh, in the in the other realm, going, man, am I glad I get glad I got out when I did with this with this heat that's going on. Yes. But now he's everywhere, and yeah. I was sharing my uh, my story about the loss of my father or the departure, if you will, the independence. How about we do that? The independence of my father, and um, wanting to talk to him. And they said, you've been talking to him, but you need to learn to listen faster. Mm. I said, well, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, see, your dad already knows. And for for lack of, for, for the sake of uh, uh, brevity, my dad or the essence that was my dad that inhabited that body, um, he already knows the question you're about to ask. <laughs> so you just need to start the question and then just shh, quiet. And the answer will be right there or you'll be guided because there was a point, I guess it was back in, in early May after the, the totaling of our Ford F-150 truck that I, I, I missed to this day, <laughs> talk yeah. about a death. Um, and I, I, I was sitting there almost in tears thinking, dad, what, what am I supposed to do now? What, what, what? And it, the, the, basically the answer that came back was keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Just keep moving forward. There's nothing yeah. specific. I, it, was, it was as if I am not going to give you a list of things to do. <laughs> Just keep moving forward and doing the things that you're doing. I'm curious as to any conversations you have had with either your mother and your or your father and or your father. Yeah, I I hear them a lot. I don't necessarily have conversations with them. But out of the blue, out of not, you know, it's not like I sit and meditate and I try and feel like what would my dad want or what would my mom want. But every every so often, and it's, it's used to happen more time. Now it happens a little bit less time. Um, I'll just feel his presence around me, mainly my dad. Because I was sort of the spitting image of my dad. I had, we had our same, we had the same bodies. We waddled the same way. I was like a <laughs> three foot version of a six foot version. Um, and uh, and I remember being down in Atlantic City. We lived in Philadelphia, so we would go to Atlantic City in the summer for a couple of weeks, and we would walk on the boardwalk there. And I remember walking with my dad, and I I held his ring finger as I walked. Um, because that was that was all I could get of his hand. I couldn't get the whole the whole hand. And um, people would stop and take pictures of us. And people would people would you know they had those rolling carts that, that they had on the on the on the boardwalk. And people would stop their carts and say, Oh, hold hold it! Can I take your picture? And I looked at him after you know like one or two times. You go, Okay, that's great. But it happened so many times, so often, mm. and. My dad was a lower middle class man. He wasn't a, he wasn't anything that, you know, anyone would know. Um, and I looked at him and I said, dad, are, are you like secretly a celebrity or something? Like, why is any, why, why are people taking pictures of you? And I, he said, Danny, he said, I don't think people see often 
two people that are exactly the same that are in two different bodies. And you are the spitting image of me. Your body looks like me. The way you walk looks like me. The way you your gesture looks like me. And then he said something that I'll never forget. He said, and you have no idea how proud that makes me. That you would choose to model yourself after me. And it makes me a better man because you do that. And I thank you. And I, I mean, I was like seven or eight years old. I, you know, I didn't know. Like, I don't. I was. I didn't. Couldn't grasp all those those ideas. Right. Um. But I think about that all the time now. Yeah. Up, you know. When I was at my father's memorial, <clears throat> and my my mother chose my brother, my younger brother, to give the eulogy. And it didn't bother me. She says, well, I wasn't sure if, if you were going to be able to make it or what have you or whatever the reason was. And as he was halfway through the eulogy, I turned to my mother and I said, perfect. You you chose absolutely correct. Uh, I just he did such a great job. Uh, but what was so fascinating to me was and I've always known this that I was named after my father. My father's middle name was Richard and his first name was Les and mine is Richard Les. And so I decided um, after getting uh, instructed, instructed by my uh, sister, my second oldest sister, that each one of us was only going to have three minutes. And by the way, I stuck to the three minutes, but nobody mm -hmm. else did. And right. that was okay. That was perfectly okay. <laughs> I get up there. Now I had my hat off while I was sitting in the chapel, but I went up there and I put my hat on and I, I declared loudly, my name is Richard Les Dugan. And it really struck a chord in me mm -hmm. because it's kind of like uh, my dad and I did not look anything alike. Mm -hmm. uh, although I carry with me certainly uh, mementos of his. Um, I, I wear a belt buckle, a, um, cowboy boots, belt buckle. Very nice. Uh, I usually wear a brown, this brown vest of his, but right now it's just too darn warm. Right. Um, uh, and I've got some other, other trinkets of his as well. Uh, I also found out he was an elk. So I now have to find out if I can transfer that membership <laughs> to the local <laughs> elks lodge for what that's worth. But it was, it was like, I never really tried to mimic my dad in that context. And I know you weren't trying to do that even at the age of seven. It's just what happened. Yeah. But I would share on these programs and with other people, the things that he shared with me, the, 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 the wise words that he shared with me, uh, eat, drink, and be merry in moderation because <clears throat> nobody gets out of this world alive. Yeah. Find a job you love doing because you're going to be doing it for a long time. Don't get stuck like me. Now, that was said before he got unstuck and went back to college. Uh, and, and and other things, too. Uh, but I learned some things about my dad at that memorial as well. That I probably knew intuitively, internally. Yeah. And but it was sure nice to hear that he was an honest man. He yeah. was the epitome of the song that I wrote that I shared with you. I'm a good man doing the best I can. Yeah, beautiful. When you are moving about, even when you're well, especially when you're sitting still, Daniel. Uh, and here you are. In your later years, as I, I'm 63 now, and uh, just a baby. Uh, yeah, just <laughs> you know, that's interesting that you would say that because when I was in my teens and 20s around adults, they would say the same thing. Really? Just a child. Just a child. <laughs> um, I I don't think about my mortality so much. I don't think about the end so much, as I think about how many years I want to continue doing this. Mm -hmm. Want to continue 
sharing my father's legacy mm -hmm. and my mother's certainly. Do you have that sense of continuing your father's legacy through what you do, what you love doing? I wish I had it more um, because my life was so, um, well, it's not by chance that I wrote a book called The Mosaic because there were pieces of my life, major important pieces that just broke off way too soon. And so my dad passed away when I was 13 so when I think about it, the first four, five, six years, even though they are foundational in terms of how a person becomes, I wasn't very aware at four, five, three, four, five years old of what I've spent the time with my dad. So I really only had a few years to be with him. One of the things that, and he was a, he was a he was a boxer. He was an art, amateur boxer, hmm. and he sort of lived his life as an amateur boxer because he was always fighting for what he believed, which was not what the world believed. The world wanted money and was chasing money, um, and he was not interested in money at all. In fact, we it, to his detriment sometimes we were not able to do some of the things he wanted to do, or he went into debt to allow us to do the things that he wanted to do. Um, but he was a lover. Hmm. He was someone that was gregarious and alive, and he fell in love with people. Um, I don't mean he was an adulterer. I mean, he just loved people. But he married my mom late in life. I think he was... Let's see, I was I passed he passed away when I was 13. So he married my mom when he was 47 years old. Or he had me when he was 47 years old. So maybe 42, 43, he got married to my mom. And so he'd lived this, he'd lived a good part of his life. But the legacy that I always feel from him that I don't know that I carry on extremely well was to just fall in love with life. Don't do what money will tell you to do all the time, because sometimes money will take you in the wrong direction. Mm. And just live as happily as you can. And yet I watched it really almost destroy him. Mm. Because he just didn't have the basis of of keeping a life together in terms of really for his family, although he would turn over in his grave if he heard me saying that. <laughs> but financially, he wasn't able to, he wasn't able to hold up. And so he went into debt. And when he passed away, then my mom took on that debt and she had no idea what to do. And so she passed away and, um, partly from the stress of that debt, but partly because she just missed my dad so much. And fortunately, that debt got handled by investments that my uncle, who was my mother's sister, married a very, very wealthy man. And he said, okay, we got to get these, these boys out of debt. And he made investments and he sort of took the portfolio and put it together. But there've been so many people in my life because I didn't have my dad and my mom that my legacy is sort of a mosaic of a bunch of different influences. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that anyone, anyone isn't that, but it's more easy when, if he would have been living still to this day and I would be, I would be the living legacy of him because I would be able to, follow him and be with him and ask him things and do things. I just don't think I had much of that opportunity as a kid, mm. not because he wasn't there, but because the questions didn't arise. Right. Right. I was out playing, playing baseball and football and basketball. I wasn't sitting with my dad saying, dad, tell me about life. 
Mm. So in a manner of speaking, you kind of you kind of missed some of that aspect of yeah. uh, of of what your your dad could have given you uh, as a child and 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 a young adult uh, in, in that respect. Yeah, and, and and I think I made up stories about what those were, but I don't know that my stories are real. Some of my stories are wanting to make my dad be better than he was, or or appear better than he was, or giving honor to my dad. You know, versus just my dad was like a, a no nonsense guy. He was he was, let's get it done. You know, let's go in there and let's not let's not let's not really worry that much about feelings. Even though he was a a really beautiful man, he didn't care about feelings. He wanted to get right down to it. And I don't know that I use that approach much in my life mm -hmm. because I've grown in a different way. I've grown and I've said, you know, something, the most effective way to get things done is to work with people to get them done. And the most effective way to be able to work with people is to park my attitude on the curb and just come together and as a mosaic, sort of play with each other and figure out where do you go from here? Yeah. Um, and when my dad took in the, in the last years of my of his life, he took a risk, and the risk was really hard. It didn't turn out to be good for him. And I think that just he, 60 years old when, is when he passed. That's not very old. I mean, I'm 68. You're 60. You're 63, mm -hmm. 62, whatever you are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so my dad had, had already been gone eight years ago for me. If I if I if I were to live his footprint. Yeah. And I believe most of what I will achieve in my life will be achieved after 60, not before. Mm. Yeah, my best friend passed away at the age of 62. Wow. Um, but I knew he wasn't going to live as long as me because he didn't take very good care of himself. And even his partner uh, uh, said the same thing. And we tend to agree on that. I had a chance to talk with his partner a few weeks ago um because i kept calling his uh my friend's cell phone mm. and he finally answered he says oh yeah well um uh, it took me a while because uh, we finally found his phone and it was dead so we had to charge it up and then when i oh. opened it up i saw there were a bunch of calls from you and i said yeah and apparently he had shared stories about us <laughs> with his wow. partner and wow. and we we had a little bit of a laugh but he's he's still going through it but it's fascinating. It is really fascinating. And I think about my eldest sister and other people that have passed in the last, um, I'm going to say two and a half years. Uh, and it seems like it comes in, in spurts, if you will. I mean, I, I don't recall losing too many people in my forties or my fifties. It wasn't until I hit my sixties, but then again, my boss, for example, he's 70, I believe 75. But there was a time, it was a year at least, during his 60s, where he lost all kinds of friends. Wow. Uh, and um, you, you, you think about that, you take a look at that, and you, you, you ask yourself, am I doing everything that I can to take as good a care of myself as I possibly can so that I can you know, live long enough to maybe complete one of the 6 million projects I've got going, you know, that I've had going oh. since I was 22 or whatever yeah. the case might be. And, and so as you speak, then I feel the legacy of my dad wanting to respond and my dad in me, you know, cultivates a whole different way of that for me. And that whole different way was, isn't, Forget about all the things you think you have to do. Forget about all the things that the world wants you to become. Forget about all the lists and all the achievements and all the, all the places where you have to succeed. Are you courageous enough to just enjoy the life that you live? Mm -hmm. And that was, that, that was my dad. Um, at the end of his days, when debt had overcome him, he couldn't enjoy the life that he lived. And so there was really nowhere for him to go in some ways except to go because his his roadmap had led to a 
sort of a brick wall, a hill coming into a brick wall. When mm -hmm. we were kids sledding, we used to sled down this really steep hill and there was a big wall at the end of it, you know. <laughs> and so it was like a challenge course for all of us to get off the sled and going really fast. But th that's what I think happened to my dad. He was yeah. sledding down a really steep incline with a way of life that turned out to hit, to not give him the happiness at the end that he wanted because he just was burdened by the world around him. And so there's some sort of gentle balance between this life of enjoyment and this life of responsibility. And I think as I sit with him and feel him really coming to me right now as we're speaking, that would be what he would say. Um, my mom, on the other hand, was very much like, I want to keep up with everybody. I want to do what everybody else is doing. I want to, you know, she was, she was just a, a, like a, I mean, I grew up in the Ozzy and Harriet days, you know, where mm -hmm. Five was best was on TV and, and there was just these, there, the shows were wholesome and good shows and the, the wives were just beautiful wives. They weren't really, they weren't the women of today. And yeah. that doesn't mean they were better than that. One's better or worse. It was just a wholly different culture. Um, and so, but they were madly in love with each other. Yeah. And yeah. that, and that love was what, that love was what propelled me on the path that I took when my parents passed away, mm. because I kept looking for where is that love that I've lost? Where is that? Where is that? place where I will be loved unconditionally. How do I find that? I had it with my mom and dad. Now, how do I find that in the world at large? And even more than that, having received it, how can I be someone that can give that to other people? Hmm. How can I love people unconditionally so that no matter what they do, they know they can always be with me and not be judged, not be, not be scorned but will be uplifted and lifted up and and um, just given the space to discover life on their own. Absolutely. My, uh, my father's, uh, I don't know that they were his final words to my mother, but I was told that he said some words to the effect to my mother. Um, I love you with my whole life. I love you with my whole life. And yeah. I take a look at my first and now I'm in my second marriage. And I don't know. I have a feeling that it, it took him years, possibly, or maybe he just knew from the very beginning uh, that she was the one. As a matter of fact, my understanding is <laughs> that he asked her out a number of times and she declined. Wow. Until I'm guessing he finally wore her down and she said, oh, OK, because <laughs> uh, she wasn't too sure about this skinny guy who rode a motor motorcycle. Yeah. Um, and I look at I, I, I even ask that question. I talk to to some of my guests in this regard, and I'm going to pose this question to you um, before we pause here. Uh, and that is the difference between being in love and loving someone. Hey. And we are talking with Daniel Levin, his book, The Mosaic, and this is Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, and I thank you so much for staying with us here on the program. Daniel, I asked you a question just before that uh, I've put to a number of people about the difference between being in love and loving someone and I'm going to throw one other element in there and the, the concept, if you will, I'd like to think it's more than just a concept of loving someone with that unconditional love. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. Uh, and I think we all know the answer in one way or another, like, there is something about the process of falling in love 
that is so magne- magnanimous, that is so magnificent, that is so sacred, that is so um, breathtaking, because it changes the way we see, the way we hear, the way the way we move through the world. Um, and when I was in college, I was someone who just, I just was in love with the, with the process of falling in love. And it turns out there's a, there's a psychological name for that. It's called limerence. And limerence is, is this sort of special circumstance, not so special, but the circumstance where people are in love with the process of falling in love, not necessarily even the person that they've fallen in love with. Like they just love falling in love. Um, and I had that for a while. I think falling in love for me has romantic or sexuality to it. I think there's some sort of component of, of male, 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 female, however you go, whatever it is, female, female. Um, there's some, there's some component of finding that other person and falling in love with that person. Loving people is spectacular but it's broader. Like I say, I have a developmentally delayed daughter. She's 34 years old now. And she, I don't know how much she understands, but she certainly knows she's loved. But I'll say to her, I feel so absolutely blessed because there's some people love people, but don't really like them. Mm Mm-hmm. Some people like people, but don't really love them. I love you and I like you. And I feel so blessed to be able to do that. And I feel loved by you and liked by you. And that relationship is so sacred when we can actually love someone and like someone. Like I have a a really close relative. I love him. I'll love him for the rest of my, my years, but I can't spend more than a few days with him without like him getting under my skin and just uh, like thinking, God, I don't even want to talk to this guy. And so we don't talk that much anymore, Mm -hmm. but I love him. Like if someone said, would say to me, Danny, do you love him? I would say absolutely without a question of a doubt, but I just don't like him. Mm -hmm. And to fall in love with someone I'm having a very, I don't know how personal I can get if I, if it's okay for me to get personal. As personal as you'd like. Um, I'm in a very interesting time in my life where love has become the blueprint through which I want to live my life by in a world that doesn't use that as their blueprint the world, the blueprint of the world that I see around me, and that could be just because I don't see clearly or I don't see well, but the blueprint of the world that I see around me is a world of I'm better than you, I've got to compete with you, I'm separate from you, I I um I dominate you, I I it's not a cooperative world, it's a competitive world. It's a it's a one upmanship world. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that everybody exists in that world, but it's, but the common denominator of most of the world that I know is how can I benefit from something you do rather than how can I give benefit to you to, to help you do what you do and to live that second way in a world that lives the first way in a world that wants to take advantage and benefit and use 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 you for its own welfare to live in a world where you're free enough to say take everything you can have all of it like i don't accept the premise by which you play by so i'm going to give you everything and you you're not but, but i'm not going to allow you 
to hurt me by doing that. I'm going to, I, I give it to you. I mean, you're not stealing it still. You want that? Let me give you more. Let me give you even more than what you asked for. I, and, and, you know, we say it in business that the people that are really successful are the people that give more than they're the people that expect them to give. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that we do that with our hearts as often as we could. Yeah. And, and so in these, in these, last in this like last year especially i've been overwhelmed by how much love guides my practice even against my will it's not i wish i could say i i i, I just jump right into it and to, and embrace it and do all that but even against my will there's something to me that is that is in the process, and I can't, I'm not expressing it very well, I don't think, of just being madly in love with the world that is, with the people that are, with meeting somebody and saying to them, you have no idea how much I love you. And men sometimes take it of a guest and think like, you know, what do you, like, what do you want from me? Mm -hmm. And and women sometimes think like, well, you're married. What are you trying to get? And and, and none of that. Like I I don't want anything from anybody. It's not. I just have this desire for people in a world where most people don't feel loved to just love people. You think that and, our language gets in the way? That it's maybe. incomplete. That it, it, we feel it, but to verbally express what we're feeling totally. the language that we have right now it's just it's just inadequate yeah and people get uncomfortable with it because because love isn't something as much as we say we want it love isn't something we feel comfortable with mm. um a, a lot of times and so to that extent i'm looking at square in the eye and i'm, I'm setting out on what in 20 in January of 2024, we'll start, I'll start something called the love tour. Mm -hmm. And my goal is to travel around the world to go to places where, where people, um, where people don't feel loved. Mm. First, I thought those were impoverished places so that I would go to places that are broken down where there are poor people, where there's, where there are people that just don't are at conflict or at war. But the more I started to talk with people, the more I started to listen to people, I don't know a place where people actually deeply feel loved. I mean, I feel some people feel deeply loved and are able to give love, but I don't, but the corporation, the corporate world has as little love in it as the um, ghetto world. And it has nothing to do with finances or it has to do with a certain temperament. Mm -hmm. It has with this, the ability of a person to open their heart and allow love to be the guide. And when you meet people, especially in a world that we live in, which is cautious of love, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many people have said, what do you want from me? Yeah. yeah. Many women have said to me, you're married. You can't talk to me like that. I said, I have no desire for you in the way you're thinking. I just want you to, I just want to love you in the moments that I'm sitting with you. I want to love you like you've never been loved before. Yeah. I would say that uh, 51 houses of government would also be places to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's a whole nother thing. But, We're talking... but when you think about it, even when you think about it, yeah. if you think about what's possible when we love one another and mm -hmm. allow that love mm -hmm. to guide us, and allow us to move together as as cooperative as cooperative people rather than as oh I got to defend myself I got to protect myself I can't love you because I I don't know what that's gonna what that's gonna feel like. I think the world changes. Yeah. So my hope is to get out there and start to create little points of love all around the world, little little small little communities of love that can bounce off one another. Yeah. Or as or as George Herbert Walker Bush said, thousand points of light. Yeah, it's a, it's a thousand <laughs> points of light, but I want to make it a thousand points of love. There because, you go. Thousand because... points of love. We're talking with uh, uh, Daniel uh, Bruce Levin and his book, of course, is called uh, The Mosaic. What is the website people want uh, that you want people to go to to find out more about um, you and the book and the love tour? 
<laughs> okay, great. Uh, so they can go to danielbrucelevin.com or they can go to the mosaiconline.com. Both of them are, are 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 different and they'll have different information and they'll be they'll be enjoyable, I think, for people. Well, I think with this interview, we'll uh, definitely connect in reference to the love tour, which we'll talk about more as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and uh, <clears throat> Daniel Levin is my guest, and we're talking about love, and we're talking about spreading that across the uh, width and breadth of this great land of ours and overseas to other countries. Uh, I, I remember as a little kid... Um, uh, hearing about, for example, uh, um, uh, discrimination and racism, those kinds of things, and thinking, do these do, do these people that feel this way, do they not understand that if you were to cut into the skin yeah. of each of the different colors of skin uh, that are out there, that you're going to see the same color of tissue and red blood, how can they be so how can they be so blind to that? I don't under, I mean, again, this was as a, a eight or nine or 10 year old. And I still don't understand how they can make these assertions. And I, I will say this uh, in regards to some of my favorite interviews. In addition to this, uh, when I talk with rabbis and when we talk about Judaism, when we talk about the laws and we talk about the philosophy and so forth. And I sit there thinking about, the hatred that is out there for the yeah. Jewish people. And I'm going, can I get a list of the things that you hate about the Jews so that I can start to dismantle that? Because you should be proud of the fact, if this is your allegation, that the Jews, quote unquote, control the media because they found a way to do it. Yeah. Why is that a problem? Yeah, if I think your race to... could do that. Wouldn't they have? I think it goes back way further than that. Because yeah, I probably. Think, <laughs> I, think there's a, I think there's a story that um, is told, which is told very, very verbosely, that a um, Jewish man through the through through time rose into the ranks of becoming the Messiah. And many people called that man Jesus. And that man then became uh, the center point of a growing mass religion and grow even if even if the re and the religion is bigger than just being Catholic, the religion is Christianity and all the different branches of that. Yeah. And the Jews, were responsible for the crucifixion of him. Well, that's not entirely true. It was actually the Romans who actually physically crucified him. The Romans him. were the ones that crucified him, but they came to the Jews and asked. Yeah, exactly. And the Jews, the Jews were the accuser, and the Romans said, "Okay, this is on your. This will last on your on your on your being." Yeah. So you are the ones that that condemned him, and and we could do nothing but just. Uh, take carry out the law and i'm and i was born jewish and i was went to orthodox seminary and i mean to say this you know but but i believe that's where a lot of the hatred for the jewish people stems well you have to wonder okay let's just say for the sake of argument that the story went the other way and they just kind of tolerated him they just put up with him until he died yeah. You wonder what would be around today. So the reverse is actually more accurate in saying thank you to the Jewish nation for right. for killing Jesus, for having him killed. Because yeah. if it weren't for you, we wouldn't have what you just described. Maybe. You know, we never know what happens if something doesn't happen. Exactly. But I understand. I understand the point of view. Yeah. But it takes a takes a fairly um, observant and removed person to get to the place where if I were to say, if someone were to come into my house and take my daughter and kill my daughter, 
Um, on some levels, it would free me up because my daughter's developmentally delayed. On some levels, it would free me up from the worry of all that. But there would be, it would be very hard pressed of me to look for a way for me to love the person that murdered my daughter. Yeah. I mean, you know, I can come up with rationalizations and being a loving, kind man, but there would be a big part of me that would want retribution, that would want to come after them, which which would want to have them experience the pain that they've put me through and certainly put my daughter through. God forbid that would, hopefully will never happen. Right. Yeah. Right. So if I think about it for me, who likes to consider himself a little spiritual person, you know, a little sort of kind, giving, loving man, if that would be my response, how can I think anything less of a group of people who felt that their teacher, their brother, their their family was was slaughtered, was crucified. Yeah. And I could see where that pending sort of feeling would be handed down generationally, generationally, generationally. And the Jews became this smaller group of people, and the Christians became this larger group of people, and they became persecuted. They became not welcome in certain places. Yeah. Uh, and and I understand it. So um I think what's like when I think about the love tour, I want to understand the stories that are being told. I want to listen to the stories. I don't want to negate any of those stories because those stories are what people feel. I just want to ask them a question. And the question is, is there any place in what you feel, even the tiniest little corner, where you can allow love to connect you to somebody else? Mm -hmm. Is there any, has there ever been any Jewish person that's been a good person that you would connect to, or is, is the whole race um, in bad? And really, that's the question of how do we create peace and harmony back in this world again because again it's not we're not going to agree like this their philosophies their religions there's things that are built on the belief systems that made us think like this so all we really have to do is get a tiny little piece and connect to that tiny little piece and just use that piece allow that piece to allow us to open up our hearts to all that that connection will bring us and all the connections that connection will be connected to. And really that's the love tour. The love tour is how do we find love again rather than all the stories that we tell ourselves? Yeah. Where we um, where we have to hate other people because they're trying to hurt us or they're yeah. trying to get something from us, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't believe in that world anymore. No, me neither. I haven't for a long, long time. Yeah. We are talking with Daniel Levin, and The Mosaic is his book. DanielBruceLevin.com is the website, and uh, you are listening to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, here with Daniel Levin, and um, I am uh, always uh, um, thrilled to have the opportunity, whether we're doing a program or sometimes we're just chatting on the phone, uh, just uh, kind of catching up and seeing how how our lives are moving forward, uh, and not so much compare and contrast as much. But one of the things that I was thinking about <clears throat> as you were sharing this this aspect of the question on the love tour and the connection that you are working to help to uh, uh, to create or help to facilitate in that regard through that question. It brought to mind a, um, a personal aspect to this that is, is a good example. The experiences that I have had in my life from the day I came into this world, kicking and screaming probably, uh, until this moment, they have made me who I am. The choices, and it's fascinating, 
the choices that I made as a child have placed me right here, right now, with you. I didn't know it then, but hindsight being what it is. And so when I think about the question and the desire for the connection between two people, four, eight, 10, 12, whatever the number is, uh, societies, what have you, when asking that question, we have to go within ourselves to find that little corner where we could love, hope it that it grows and expands. Maybe that's the wrong word, but nonetheless. And then that then determines where our lives and civilization will go next. One of the, the, you know, it's a sad thing that we've got people in, for example, Ukraine who are fighting for their lives and their country, and they're willing to do it. They are willing to do this, and they are willing to work together. They, that's one of the things, too, that they're doing. They are working together, collectively, to accomplish a particular goal. They wish they didn't have to do it this way. But this is the way that they are. Uh, this is the way they're doing it, yeah. and uh, and so forth. So, the comparison is for me to better understand who I am and to love myself for who I am. The light and the dark side. In order for me to transcend that to the society, to the civilization, I need to find that little corner. <clears throat> and I need to look outward and say, okay, uh, I don't, I can love without liking. Okay. Uh, I really can because that person has every right to be here on this planet, just like me. I don't have to like what he or she does or says or believes. It's irrelevant. They're a human being. They're a member of the family regardless of their skin color, regardless of their uh, their uh, political affiliation, their religious affiliation, and the list goes on. They're a member, and I love them as a member. Yeah. And who knows what I will learn from them that I can incorporate into my life. Yeah. I think you know I love the I love those questions and I love the way you think and I love oftentimes I find I'm not capable of living that place. I I I it's my dream that's what I want you know but then my brother does something that pisses me off or you know and I just you know I I I don't think in the general beautiful world of that where I want to live I I think of the world that I'm in right now at this moment where someone's hurt me and you know I have to respond um but what gives me a lot of um what gives me a lot of comfort even though it's somewhat uncomfortable is realizing that as many people as that I know each one of them has the right to believe whatever they believe. And they do. And consequently, when I come face to face with anybody in this world, I can be guaranteed that I'm not going to be looking in a mirror as much as I think that some parts of them mirror back to me who I am. And maybe all parts of them mirror back to me who I am, the parts that I like and the parts that I don't like. Mm -hmm. but I can be pretty sure I'm not going to see a reflection of myself, even though, play with this, even though the reason I see what I see is clearly because of the way that I perceive the world that I perceive. So I do see a reflection of myself, right? And in, in whether I love them or I don't love them, I see a reflection of myself because the way that I come to deal with the world that I live in is a reflection of myself. And 
there's something still beautiful in knowing that that diversity of humanity holds a place for every single person to be a part of this mosaic of life in exactly the way they choose to. And the greatest gift that I can give to my mosaic is to bring all of those pieces together to form whatever shape or form or, or, or image they want to create and to have that be the, the calling card of what a beautiful life looks like. When I have pieces that all look like me, it, not many people want to look at that mosaic. Um, it's not very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> but seeing all these different pieces, it makes it so fascinatingly interesting. And you, And I know that when I meet somebody along the street, I'm seeing a corner of who they are. And I can stay at that corner for as long as I want, or I can just go, hey, let's do this. Let's see what happens when we mm -hmm. go here. Yeah. And the experiences that are happening, just one final thing, the experiences that are happening in my life of falling in love with love and falling in love with people are really at the um, forefront of this connection becoming deeper. Mm. And there's an interesting uh, holographic element to this. You are building your own personal mosaic. I am building my own personal mosaic. Totally. And as the other 8 billion plus people on the planet are building their own personal mosaics, those 8 billion plus mosaics make up a global mosaic. I mean, and you could take it from one level to the next personal and then family and then city, state, nation, et cetera. But it ultimately comes down to the global mosaic. Totally. And, and, and there's a mosaic of thought. There's a mosaic of action. There's a mosaic of, of, in, of the way we play in the world. There, it, when that book came to me as a cute little story, I always knew that the real story was not in the words that I wrote, although the words that I wrote were charming. The real story was in the spaces between the words. Mm -hmm. And when I listened to what the space between those words said, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of stories that that space talked about. Well, this is, this is to me... Uh, sort of the crux of of where we're going. I want to talk to you as we get close to the end of our program here about one element that I came across in the first 15 years of my career in this business, and it was one of the most it was one of the filthiest, most disgusting words you could ever utter amongst these people. What is it? I'll tell you in just a minute as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And what was that word that Christians did not, specifically Christians, because I was working for a Christian station, did not want to deal with? And I believe you incorporate this in the mosaic, and that is the word responsibility. Yes. We must take responsibility for all of the choices that we make, for all of the actions that we take, all of the words that we speak. Uh, and believe it or not, there is a certain element of control one does have over one's thoughts. Uh, you know, it takes practice. Okay, <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm there. But if I can keep those thoughts that I really might want to kind of toss out from becoming actions or words out loud, well, then I've I've accomplished something. At least I haven't put that charged energy out there in that regard. But responsibility, talk to us about that in the context of 
not only the mosaic, but also in the context of loving and allowing ourselves to be loved. So the place that I want to, because when I hear it, I hear two things. I hear the liberation of doing that, and I hear the bondage of doing that. Mm -hmm. There's something in that sense of, oh, you have to take responsibility that really like, cranks you in and bind like it, it's it's almost bounds you to this thing um who we are i believe is who we are and whether we take responsibility for it or not we will continue to be who we are until we decide to be something different. And so I can tell you only from my own personal experience. There have been so many beautiful moments in my life where almost out of my own doing, not because of my own doing, but outside of my own doing, mm -hmm. I just felt this blessing come upon me to be able to love more than I hated. But there are other things that should be really easy for me to do. I, I have a big belly. I, I look like Santa Claus, you know, and there's no reason why I have to look like Santa Claus. You would think if I would take responsibility for the way I move, the way I eat, the way I do things that I do, that I could be done with this in three, four, five months, six months, maybe, maybe a year maximum. And I could take responsibility for that, but that responsibility seems to evade me all the time. And so what do I feel as a result of that? I could feel that I, God, Danny, you just can't even do the simple, this most basic thing, which is just watch what you eat. Take, go outside and take a walk. Even though you have pain, just get outside and do something, eat a little bit less, you know. But when I look at what my day is like, it's very rarely that I eat too much. There's an emotional component to my pain, an emotional component to my body that allows me to sort of, that invites me to protect myself through my body because I think, oh my God, you know, you're sort of a good guy. And if you don't give any protection, you're going to get, you're going to get taken advantage of. You're going to get, you know, so many people are going to want to be in your presence and want your love that you're just not going to be able to put up with it. So I put some barriers up. Sounds so egoic as I'm saying it to myself because that's not, I don't feel that way in terms of, I don't feel like it's an egoic thing. I just feel like the more attractive I, I am, I know what it's like being as attractive as I am, which is, you know, on a scale of one to 10, maybe a four or a five, okay? <laughs> it's, not, it's not like a 10. But if I were lean and fit and strong, which I have some proof of when I was when I was doing all that, when I was younger, and I and I was bench pressing three hundred and forty five pounds and weighing one hundred and seventy pounds, I had an affair, and that affair ruined my life. I'm not a person that would ever have an affair, and that affair basically put a template over my whole being that said. You're never going to get like that again. I'm not going to allow that to happen because I'm I, I'm not going to I'm not going to allow you to be that person that could so easily fall into this because the power of love is powerful and like falling in love is so easy and falling in love with no barriers is prone to making a lot of mistakes. So I think my body has said to me, I got a deal for you. You continue to fall in love all you want. I'm just not going to make you less attractive to people. It doesn't really work because people fall in love with who you are, not what you look like. But at least in my mind, it creates a, a mental barrier that I'm going to say, okay, I can, I can, I can, you know, go, go the extra step because who's going to, who's going to fall in love with this. 
you know, it's 70 pounds overweight or something like that. You're not going to want that. So what's the responsibility that we really have to take? Bringing it around full circle and tying a little pink ribbon on our conversation. Mm -hmm. My dad would say, the only responsibility that you have, Danny, is to love people with all your heart, to raise them up as high as they can go, even if it's to your detriment, to not sell out because somebody wants to give you money, but just to stay true to the principles of caring about others more than you care about yourself. It's what he lived for and it's what he died because of. So I love this inquiry that we're having with you. It really takes me to a place where I really have to reevaluate where what it is that I go forward with now. And then interesting, <clears throat> these interviews that uh, these conversations, I, I rather refer to them as conversations, uh, actually, they get me starting to evaluate thinking yeah. about uh, the choices that I have made. Uh, and uh, not that I can go back and change them, mind you, but saying, okay, is this really where I want to be? Or do I want to be somewhere else? 100%. Do I want, is this is who I, is this who I want to be? Or do I want to be someone else? And uh, I think that's, I think that's a good thing. Um, I, I think it's phenomenal. Yeah. I think that for all of us, if we can, if we can get to that place, uh, it can really be uh, cathartic, if you will, to use, I, I love those words, uh, cathartic in, uh, in propelling us forward to being the better human being. Yeah. It's not to say that we're bad human beings right now. It's just saying that, as I like to say, there's always room for improvement. And yeah. that's okay. That's perfectly okay. And yeah. if you don't want to, you don't have to. Well, what you're explaining or what you're describing right now happened for me in our conversation today. And I really want to thank you for that. Well, you are very welcome. Uh, and uh, we're talking with uh, Daniel Bruce Levin and uh, we'll be Connected to his website, DanielBruceLevin.com, here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, and we have been spending this uh, hour plus with uh, Daniel uh, Levin, a good friend uh, of mine, and really, really enjoy the the uh, the camaraderie, the friendship, the uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, we do commiserate. We are kind of, uh, you know, we kind of go through the similar things, and and uh, we kind of share that and in our insights as we've moved forward. And I hope that uh, you folks have have uh, been able to glean something from this program. But you know me, Daniel. Uh, you know that uh, this isn't quite the end. I have no. those three questions once again. Matter yep. of fact, I think one of these questions I have never asked you because we we try to change them up a little bit every so often. Well. But before I ask you those questions, I want to thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, where we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., 9 a.m. on Wednesdays for a special edition of Tell Me Your Story, streaming live at those times at richarddugan.com. We uh, have podcasts on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and a whole bunch of other places, too numerous to mention. We're also on YouTube. That's right. You can watch these interviews. We hope that you will. We also hope you'll select uh, notifications so that when a new conversation is posted, uh, you will be able to be notified and listen to that conversation. We also ask that if you can support the work we're doing financially, we would greatly appreciate that. We have a PayPal account. And it's there for your security as well as ours. We also ask that you spend some time going within and listening to that still small voice, that intuition that will help guide you and instruct you. Pardon me, folks. As we, uh, as we wrap things up here, we go to our final questions. 
And the first of those questions is, who is Daniel Bruce Levin? Wow. Um, I, Daniel Bruce Levin, am a man whose heart is huge. A man who loves more than he knows what to do with. And a man who has tons of questions that still are pieces of my mosaic that are waiting to come into place. And I love every step along the way. I love the completed version and I love the broken up version because to me, love is the only thing that takes me to the place where I can be the free Daniel Levin that I want to be. What uh, is your life's purpose? It's changed over time. I, I think now my life's purpose is to create little points of love in cities, towns, villages all across the world where these little points of love can gain strength from. And it might be a two, three, four, five, six, eight people in a place. It might be hundreds of people, but they can gain strength from the fact that there are other people that are here to rewrite the script of this world from a world of um, competition and one-upsmanship to a blueprint of love. And finally, what was your best day? Wow. There have been a lot of best days. Hmm. I think my best day... And this is hard because as I say, as one comes to mind, 10 others push to want to be said. <laughs> but I think my best day was the day that I realized this world that seems so real, seems so sort of stayed. There's a formula where we go, we we go to school, we go to college, we start, we get married, we we end up going into a profession. We live in that profession, and we just stay in that profession, and we make friends with the people that are closest to us, and we um, and we play by the rules of that game. Mm. I think my best day was when that mosaic broke in front of my eyes. Mm. And I had to look for all the pieces that were a part of it, but they didn't reassemble in the way they were assembled before. Hmm. And I think there's some, some stuck behind the cushion in the couch too, by the way. So hey, I check hey, there. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> and well, the Daniel, thank you. <clears throat> I, I, I can't, I can't tell you how much I appreciate our time together and we will get together again. Uh, we'll go uh, the next time we get together, we are going to go further into detail into the uh, the love tour that's coming up in January 2024. We'll give some more details because uh, I know you're still working on them. So love we're it. looking forward to uh, having you up here in Santa Barbara as you pass through. Love it. I can't wait. All right. And I thank you for listening to and watching. Tell me your story. New paradigms for a new world. We're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true until our next broadcast, podcast, video cast, love to lol. Jeanette, I am listening. Dad, continue to be happy. And my friend Doug, I miss you.